But Ron has taken all of this um, in her stride, which apparently is a real Ron trademark, which I'm looking, um, looking forward to hearing all about. Apparently nothing really phases Ron, including being asked to join us at very short notice um, at today's event. But Ron has been the head of um, real estate for Cisco. She uh, um, has had a multinational outlook, has faced very different local challenges working uh, with the Scottish Government, um, and is indeed coming here today to inspire all of us. So thank you very much, Ron. I will hand over to you just now. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. Can you hear me? Um, I am Ron Cockill. It's Veronica, right? The only person in my entire life who has ever called me Veronica is my mum on a Sunday and my grandpa. Uh, now, being a Ron in construction, usually people think you're going to see a man. Most people here probably thought Ron Cockill, it's a man. It is sad to say it still is as real today as it was 30 years ago when I went into construction. So why am I here? A, it was really short, but I we had to get someone. Um, <laughs> um, and Linda, who's just jumped out, um, kindly invited me, and I was really excited. And then I read the bios of everybody else that's doing it, and I thought, oh my god, what have I done? Um, and I phoned her and said, I don't think I can do this. I'm, I'm too normal. Um, and I've known Linda for a long time, and she went, you're the least normal person I've ever met. Thanks to Linda for the invite. I'm going to try and actually show you more of what I do, okay? Because I am unfortunately the only woman I know, pretty much anywhere in the world, that does what I do. That's really sad and it's really lonely. Um, but it's great as well because you get to be the boss. <laughs> so the reason I think I'm relevant for you guys today is I am you. I am born and bred in the west coast of Scotland. I'm from Campus Lines. I went to the local school. I studied at the Mac. I am dyslexic. I was not the smartest kid at school, but I was probably one of the most hard working. Um, and one thing people will always say about me is I am passionate. It's great to hear Sarah's passion. One thing everybody always says to me, especially in sessions like this, is God, you love what you do. And I absolutely love what I do. I am a mother of two. Um, my son is autistic, which is interesting, gives us little challenges. More trouble from my daughter, I have to say. I am a wife. Sister of seven, so I'm one of eight kids. Right? So, eight being one of eight teaches you resilience, so I'll talk a lot about resilience. <laughs> and a mentor. Um, I try and mentor as many people as possible, formally and informally, both male and female. It's really, really important you learn as much from mentoring as you actually impart. But what others people say is, God, she's impulsive. And you're about to see why. Um, driven, detailed. I've got a great memory. And that's a great thing to have. It's also a curse. Because everybody always assumes that because you can remember everything, you actually know it. But I can spit facts out that I had six months ago in a darkened room, like to come out with the top of my tongue. And forceful. So, being what I do, doing what I do, being where I am, being the only woman in a team of a couple of hundred people, you have to be forceful, right? And sometimes that demonstrates itself in different ways. Right, this is how you can see where I'm impulsive. Can you all hear me at the back? Yeah? I don't want to stand in front of the lecture. Okay. This is more about where I've done it. So I build things, I build big things. Trained as an architect, and obviously started in Glasgow, right? Uh, studied at the Mac, great place, really difficult. I was one of 40 women who started the year. I was one of five women that finished it, that graduated. Of the 40 men that started the same year as me, 38 graduated, right? So difficult course. This is where it starts getting interesting. I won a scholarship to Poland. Didn't really mean to. I'm positive for it's coming back. Um, I've done my last year thesis in Warsaw because a friend of mine lived in Warsaw. Went over to visit them, found an interesting site, did my thesis there. Got talking to the local university, 
They said, fill this form in, fill the form in. Two months later, I was living in Poland. <laughs> Fantastic. Then it opens your eyes. Bizarrely enough, then I moved to Sheffield. Don't ask me why. It was the only <laughs> job I could get. Coming out of uni, it was the only job I could get. But then I moved back to Glasgow, and then I qualified as an architect. And immediately I was sent to Finland. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, this is the impulsive thing. Did I ask my now husband? So I should have it off. Now husband, then partner, can I go and live in Finland? No, I didn't actually, I just did it. <laughs> he is very, very nice, but he stayed in Glasgow and we had a long term relationship. Um, then I moved back to Glasgow and they sent me to Amsterdam. <laughs> right, so you've seen a theme here, okay? Once you get labelled as a person who's willing to move, to go, to experience different things, and as long as you're open to the experience and see what the other cultures and people can bring to you, you get an opportunity to do what I've done. So Amsterdam is, as most people will know, is really good fun, and it's featured quite a lot in my life. Cisco then hired me. Now Cisco, this is way back um, in the 2000s, where Cisco was actually a small firm in Europe, I think it was about a thousand people. It's now 120,000 people, so it grew really fast, and I was there for it growing, and it was really good fun. Right. So I was hired by Cisco back to Glasgow, and then really quickly <laughs> sent back to Amsterdam. <laughs> I'll show you what I built in Amsterdam because it was quite spectacular. But at this point, I'm 25, 26, um, got a lot of European experience. Got a lot of build experience, got a lot of construction <coughs> experience, got a lot of people experience, and it just kept going. So I then went to look Paris for a year to build a campus in Paris. Don't speak a word of French. <laughs> Never ever managed to get it. Because they also thought it was so hysterical when I tried it and just laughed at me. <laughs> um, and then five years to London. Now we built two campuses in London and actually was the global, well, the head of the European real estate for Cisco at this point, and I was about 32. It was such a long time in London because I actually had a really bad accident. So I was in a wheelchair and it took four years to learn to work again. So that was fun. Taught me more resilience, taught me patience, okay? If you're stuck in a wheelchair, trust me, you learn patience. But then, he said, what do you want to do next? And I went, I'm bored of London. Let's, let's blow this gig. I went to San Francisco for three years. Now, San Francisco is fab. Um, Cisco's base is actually San Jose. I refuse to live in San Jose because it is just soulless. So we lived in San Francisco and we built two campuses in there. Then they said, what do you want to do next? And I went, Asia looks good. Um, <laughs> And specifically at that point in time, Cisco were building a huge campus in Bangalore. It started about a million square feet. Difficult if you're not in construction to know how much a million square feet is. It's quite a lot. And it went up to about 14 million square feet. We also built a 2 million square feet campus in Shanghai, something in China, something actually in Beijing, something in Tokyo, and something in Sydney. So two years in Hong Kong and India, and then a year in Shanghai. So Cisco did the expo in Shanghai. I got to go to Shanghai for a year. And then I got bored, actually. I had two kids at this point in time. Um, and my son had just had his diagnosis of autism. So we needed to get home because there wasn't support for autistic children in Asia. They don't actually recognize it, believe it or not. So I came home, left Cisco, came home. Very, very difficult decision to make because I love Cisco. I decided to go into Scottish government for five years, and what a change! Oh my God, <laughs> it was it was sobering. Um, <coughs> it was great, great experience. I wouldn't be where I am just now if I hadn't done this. It was a learning experience, but it was completely different. You went from a go, 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 get it done, get it done, get it done to how do you fill that form in here? Then Barclays came knocking. Um, it's always nice when you get hands hunted. It's really nice. I must admit, it kind of boys you up. But after five years in Scottish government of filling in forms, you really want somebody to tap you on the shoulder and say, you're the person we want. So I actually went to London for three years, commuted up and down, um, 
and uh, oddly enough, got them out of buildings. So back was at this point, we're shrinking just after the financial crash. Got them out of buildings. Great fun in London. And then they basically said, do you want to go back to Glasgow? Tradeston City Centre, we're building about 700,000 square foot. Um, and I'll show you some images of it in a second and you can actually kind of get a scale of it. Barclays is fun. You wouldn't think that could be fun. But doing what I do and when I'm doing it and how I'm being allowed to do it is fantastic fun. But I only get to do that because I've done all of this. <coughs> this is the map of an impulsive woman. But the first time somebody actually said to me, God, you're so impulsive. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm the most organized person I've ever met. And they went, no. And then <laughs> it was a, social, a psychologist and then they sort of mapped all of this out. And they went, how long did it take you to decide? to go to San Francisco, and I went, oh, about, oh, about a minute. <laughs> and then I went, did you speak to your partner, your husband? And I was like, no. And they went, normal people wouldn't do that in a minute, and they would probably speak to their spouse. And I went, I need to be up for it, that's fine. Um, so I'm pretty impulsive, but that has given me the benefit of being able to respond to opportunities that have been given. I am not the smartest person I know. I work with women and men who are far cleverer than me. But because I've always been willing to take a challenge, take a risk, it's meant that I've had a really, really interesting career. Right, so what do I do? I build things. Now, like I said, unfortunately, women in, in, in the construction industry, especially in Europe, not so much in Asia, especially in Europe, in North America, are pretty rare. Usually, they're the architects who do the door schedules, they're not the primary designers, they're certainly not the construction side. This was the first thing, the main construction thing we worked on at Cisco, and it's 600,000 square feet in Amsterdam. And I chose the site. I didn't actually build it, but I effectively designed it with the architects and we delivered it. And as you're sitting there at 25, 26, what a great thing to be involved in. And from this, I actually learned project management. I was lucky to work with a great guy called Peter Felton. He taught me how to manage a project for life size. London? London was slightly different. I wasn't a huge sure at the time. But what we actually did is fit out a quarter of a million square feet in six months. Now, fitting out is where you actually take a shelf of building and you make it happen or work for people. But that was probably one of the most difficult projects I've ever worked on because we had all of the execs. And all of these ex-wives thought they knew what they wanted. And they wanted to choose the carpets, they wanted to choose the pillows. That was a really challenging project. We did lots and lots of stuff in Europe. I'm not going to show you Paris, I'm not going to show you Italy. You can actually look at all the stuff online. But in San Jose, it was different again. So America is a wonderful place to work. And you've got to embrace it. You've got to go. You've got to be enthusiastic. You can't be cynical West Coast of Scotland person, or you will not enjoy it. <laughs> so you just got to roll with punches. And as much as I hate the architecture of that building, we all love it. Right? So we built that. I, it's not something I thought when I put up these slides. I was like, it's a really ugly building. But they love it. It's in all of the brochures. We built it. We're very proud of it. We built fantastic spaces inside, fantastic external spaces for staff and they absolutely love it. To give you a scale, San Jose campus for Cisco is about 14 million square feet. It's probably about five or six times the size of your campus here. It is enormous and still growing. <coughs> but then I got to go to Asia, and Asia is, I, I should have been born in Asia, I've decided. Um, <laughs> I chose to live in Hong Kong, which is proper Asia, not Singapore, which is Asia light. I'm not saying Singapore is not fabulous, but it's all Asia light variations. <laughs> and I got to spend one, two weeks every month in India. Now, if you ever get a chance to go and work in India, take it. It is the most terrifying place on earth. It's the fabulous place on earth. And if you can deal with what you see around you, you will come out richer for it. The people are bright, they're smart, they're ambitious, they're clever, but they come from a completely different background. So when I see the poverty in the streets, it's terrifying for me. They don't even see it. 
but you have to work from within to make changes. So we bought a bit of dirt with Cisco and we built, or they're still building it, 14 million square feet. There's about 9,000 people there. Now this is where you've got to learn to use your influence. So when we bought that bit of dirt, we bought it from a village elder. And what we wrote in, well I wrote into the deal, the deal was that we had to hire X percentage of the people from the village to build it, to operate it, to maintain it. So we, we weren't just going to blow this village off the map, we wanted to integrate with it. Because if you don't do that, if you're just building these things and you're walking away and hoping they're going to operate, you're not really improving the lives of the people around them. The village also got power, the village also got water, right? So we think that's part of the project. And it's one of the most successful campuses on the world at the moment, on lots of awards. Then China. Okay, China and India are phenomenal, completely different. Um, I love India, I probably love China more. And that's just because the people are so fantastic. They're so diverse, they're so interesting, they're so interested in you, they want to learn. Um, you walk into a meeting in, in India, people will kind of do what you tell them, or they'll make you think they're doing what you tell them. <laughs> <laughs> you walk into a meeting in China, and you get a thousand questions. Mm -hmm. right? Nobody just takes you on face value, which is fantastic. So I got to do the Shanghai Expo for Cisco. This was just literally before I left. And we developed, not a huge campus, but a, sort of a couple of buildings in Shanghai for them at the same time. Now, China is fantastic. It is just an amazing, energetic place. And again, if you ever get a chance to go and live there, strongly recommend it. Make sure you've got a strong stomach. Some of the food you're invited to eat is interesting. But again, if you go with it, you'll find the food is fantastic. I'm still with it. Okay, so that brings me, I'm not going to talk about the Scottish Government because I can only talk to you about so many bits of paper being pushed for VTV. But when I was at Scottish Government, we moved, I was the head of the Department of Real Estate for one of the sort of government departments, and we basically moved 400 offices. Right? So it was really complicated, it was really difficult. But like I said, it taught me from going go, 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 it taught me governance, it taught me control. And I could never have landed at Barclays with its governance structure without having gone through Scottish Government. So again, when you're in, in a job, make sure you take as much out of the job as you can. Right? Don't sit in a job and think, oh, I'm really bored, this was really dead end, I'm not challenged. Look and see what you can learn. So the campus, um, does everybody know where it is? Yeah? Um, Right. So it's on the banks of the Clyde. I'll give you a bit of. It's okay if I talk about this, yeah? Okay. On the banks of the Clyde, and if you drive past or you go past it, you will see a huge amount of activity. Currently, we've got about 600 people on site. It's going to go up to about 1,200 in the next couple of weeks, next couple of months. Um, and I'm called the program director. What do I do? What am I responsible for? Um, everything. Absolutely everything. It's great fun. Um, when I was in London, I was a part of the team that actually selected Glasgow. I'm not saying I influenced it, but I feel, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I had been in the room when they were making the decision in right and going to Manchester. It pulls two and a half thousand jobs with it. So this isn't a small, this isn't just about a project. This is about people's lives, <coughs> securing jobs, huge part of our boomer generation. Um, probably the bit I've learned most on this project was about the negotiation on the land deal and with the developer. And when I say we did a 40 hour straight stint to get the deal signed, I am not lying. Um, the City of Glasgow is an interesting organisation to work with. <laughs> really, really wonderful, really helpful, lots of incredibly interesting people. But again, if I hadn't gone through Scottish Government, I think I would have struggled somewhere by now, because I get what they've got to do. Right? If I didn't have that background, 
are you sitting in meetings thinking, why is this taking you so long to change that light? <laughs> <laughs> and then back to what I learned in London. So we've got two and a half, three thousand people at the moment, all of whom think they've got an <coughs> for this building, for these buildings. It's great fun because lots of people have got lots of interesting ideas, but lots of people have also got some really stupid ideas. <laughs> and you have to take every single idea, and you have to look at it, and you have to think about it, and then you have to say yes or no. I get to say yes or no, which is great, but also means I've actually got to look at everything. And it's right down from doggy daycare to doggy grooming. <laughs> um, but it also lets me push things, so I'll show you a couple of interesting things. The money is probably the bit that's, that gets most people a bit, ooh, that's got a lot of money. So I'm responsible for about half a billion pounds. Right? And I have to land this project on budget, and I have a date. It has to be done by the 19th of November, 2021. Okay? So it's, my boss every night says, are you on program? Are you on budget? Are you, where are you? But it is a huge amount of money, and we are currently in our third audit, so we're constantly getting audited. But probably the bit I enjoy most is building the team. So 12 months ago, it was a team of one. It was me, right? Honestly, and I'm not joking, it was me. We're about now up to about 400 people, um, and we'll be up 1,200, maybe, 1400 when we're on site and everything's happening together. Right, core team is about 50, and there's three women. Okay, now, I'm not saying the men aren't great, the men are fantastic, but if this was India, if this was Asia, it would probably be near half and half. Right, if this was North America, it'd be a better proportion than that, but this is Western Scotland, and women do not go into this industry. I walk into rooms, if I walk in late, which I frequently do, um, people think I'm there to get the tea. It happens every single week. My guys now love it, because it embarrasses the hell out of people and it puts them on the back foot. But it is really hard, right? And I've had to fight to get these three women onto the project. I've had to get a four. So what else did I do? I oversee the design. My background is architecture, I'm a qualified architect. So I feel like as an architect a hard time. <laughs> build it, which is currently what we're doing, and figure out how we build it. And then the fitting it out. So we're about to spend not quite half of the cost fitting this thing out as we are building it. And this isn't going to be any normal business part. This is going to be <coughs> really, really different. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Is this a laser printer? Oh, yes, excellent. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Anybody knows Glasgow, Kingston Bridge, Central Station, George V Bridge, that's the Gorbals, actually it's Lauriston, the Gorbals are here. Uh, that's the International Financial District, they have the nerve to call it. And this is the site, right? Now, this site used to be where they built ships. In the 50s, believe it or not, that little site there used to build ships. It also used to be where the ferries went caroling from. It used to have an engineering work, it used to have a brickworks, it used to have a chapel on it, to be a graveyard here as well. So it's a really interesting part of Glasgow's fabric. Absolutely core, city centre. And what did they do in the 50s and the 60s? They knocked it all down. Okay? Two listed buildings remain. Now, this is interesting because, again, being able to influence people, um, Initial thoughts was we would go here. It's a simpler site, we could have built it faster, probably built it a little bit cheaper, but there's nothing there. This was all knocked down a couple of years ago. It's just flat ground. Here, we've got a chance to actually save some of the glass region fabric and tie into the, the city. So, although this is much more complicated, we chose this site over this site because of what it lets us do, right? And what does it actually let us do? The architect gave me these slides. I'm not sure I want to bore you senseless with them. Um, I'll go here. So, that's the river. 
That's the George V Bridge. That's the Squinty Bridge. Traston's down here, yeah? And um, Glasgow is over the top. What we're actually doing is basically creating a park in the city for the citizens of Glasgow, for everyone. Now, trust me, this was not an easy sell to the bank. <laughs> we are buying, that's the developers holding on to that, we are buying 6.7 acres of ground at quite a lot of money, trust me. And about half of it is going to basically go back to an urban park for everybody to use. Right? Um, we're also building a crash. We're building a crash for our staff because about 50% of the staff in Glasgow are female. And we reckon that more than about 50% will be under 30. Okay? We've got a huge transgender population in Barclays. We're absolutely the hire of choice in Scotland for this. Um, we actually want to make sure we have full inclusivity and diversity on the site. So we have looked at everything you can imagine. I mean everything. Three buildings. <coughs> this one here is the fourth building that will be coming up potentially in a couple of years, but at the moment it's just going to be landscaped. And then the list of buildings, which I'll talk about in a second. The developer has held this portion in the corner. Now, it's next to the railway bridge, it's going to be quite noisy. That is going to be an office block, and that is going to be housing. So that's going to be an 18-storey housing block that you'll see when you come into Glasgow on the left-hand side of the railway from Paisley. And we're not building normal office buildings. Now, when we started this, the brief was build what you call an architecture grey box. So something that's really quite simple. <coughs> but again, I was like, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. This is Glasgow. It's got a huge, complex urban environment. The site has got massive, massive um, historical links with the city. Industrial past, shipbuilding past. I'm not going to build a glass box on it. Why on earth would we buy the site if that's all we we're going to do? So we're actually going to build something really different. We're going to build something that talks, that's a steel facade, something called Code 10. So if you walk up to it in a couple of years, you'll rub it and you'll get rust on your hands. Okay? It's the stuff they make ships out of. That's what that facade is going to be made of. But we've got lots of glass. So this is the urban park. You'll see lots and lots and lots of grass for people, lots of cycle routes. Oh, sorry. And then you can just sort of see the work on the facades. So making sure that there's a lot of interest in, we've got terraces, we've got patios, we've got a rooftop cafe. Again, explain to people in London that these areas might not get used very much. <laughs> um, it's been interesting, because they keep saying to us, but you've got the rooftop cafe, why won't people use that? And I'm like, well, they will. <laughs> Two or three days of the year, <laughs> the rest of the time they'll be inside. So we need to make sure we've got enough stuff inside is out. Um, and how did we do it? So what we're doing is how we did it is as important as what we're doing. So massive staff engagement. I probably spent 30% of my time standing up in front of groups and telling them what we're doing. So when Linda asked me to do it, I was like, yeah, I've got this nail and then she told me what it's about. <laughs> so we've got one tomorrow. We've got a group of 500 people next week. We're briefing. I go to London. We're actually going to go to Pune where we're doing a very similar thing in September. And we've done a couple of million square feet in America that I've been out to a couple of times as well. Because I really don't really get to do this in Glasgow. I'm connected to everything that's happening globally. Ah, sorry, the slide things. And that's actually the final, the overall scheme. We broke ground in November. Um, we only got approval to actually do this in July. So if anybody knows anything about construction, that's fast. That's not just Europe fast, that's Asia fast. That's China fast. Um, the first building, that one, touch wood. <laughs> We will have people in before Christmas next year. We'll have about 1,500 people in. And the next two buildings and the creche will be up within 12 months of that. So by the end of 2021, 
with the exception of one of the listed buildings, this thing here, pretty much this will be completely finished. You'll be able to walk along, you'll be able to ride your bike, <coughs> you'll be able to go to the cafes that are in here, the restaurant that's in here, the coffee bar that's in here, and you'll be able to use the site. Okay? Why did we choose this site? Location. Right? It's a phenomenal site. But like I said, we could have chosen these sites here. Just as good. Actually slightly closer to our staff. But this kick starts the investment on this side of the river. So again the bank, whatever you say about banks, this was a this was a physical decision the bank made to spend a bit more money, but actually make sure that the regeneration on the south side of the river started. The money goes further on the south side of the river than it would on the north side. And the city are busily working up what they do with these nine blocks of which the city owned two. Okay? Can I just get this? Is that like where it used to be Remnick Kings? Yeah, Remnick Kings was there. So that's that. The, bit, the straight road is the one you go along and then you turn in to use the bus. The road along Clyde Place along the water is going. Right, in October, so you can hate me in October if I should come to work. But in a year, you're going to get it back as a walkable park, which will be much, much more fun than driving it. Um, projects of this size and this complication <coughs> are never straight line. So if we're carrying another 2,500 people, we don't want to build space and then have no one to fill it. So we've had to fit out an interim space that holds about 900 people as well as doing everything. This project normally <laughs> would have taken us six to nine months. We did it in 14 weeks. Right? And that's because if you have to do something, you just get it done. You think of different ways, you improvise. Remember that impulsive thing? Somebody said, how fast could you do it? And we said, 14 weeks, and they went to do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we did it. Um, and then this is the other thing that we enjoy here. So. Right, the, build, the site has got two listed buildings on it. Now, the city had previously, wrongly in my opinion, given permission for these buildings to be knocked down by other developers. And one of them actually had gone all the way to the House of Lords, and that had been rejected. So the site had stagnated because nobody could figure out how to tie these buildings into the site. <coughs> of the time we're spending on this project, probably about 30% is on this building and the other listed building called Beco. I wanted to show you some images of what we're doing because it's going to be spectacular. You're going to be really impressed. It's going to be one of the coolest places in Glasgow. Because effectively we're going to, we're not doing this anymore. We're actually going to keep it as a space. And we're knocking out all the structure and you're basically going to have a five story space that you can have coffee in. As far as I'm concerned, this is all about coffee to me. How much coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Again, what else have we done? April, you don't spend, you don't do this kind of work to the city without telling the city what you're doing. So actually tomorrow it opens officially, this little gateway, we call it, um, which is sitting on the site, that's the one of the cranes. This is the gateway on the site, that will actually start being open to the public, so you can go in and there's a sort of storyboard tells you what's happening. We're opening it for community events, Barclays has got a huge DNI forum that will be using it as well. The DNI team are actually launching this beside tomorrow. And then this is actually from last month, the construction. So again, this is from George V Bridge. That's the Kingston Bridge there, and you can start to see it come out of the ground. And you will just see it go crazy. Stay work arrives tomorrow for the first building. And it will start coming up really, really fast now. We are trying to tie in with the local community. We are trying to work with the local community, with the local authorities. <coughs> They're a really fascinating project, but it is going super fast. Okay, how are we doing for time? Got a couple of minutes. Right, cool, we have time then. Last couple of slides. I read um, the principal's brief for this session, and again, like I said, I was a bit terrified about <laughs> who else was speaking. I mean, how'd you follow that? Um, and I said, dream, believe, achieve, and I thought, well, that's a bit fluffy for me. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I'm the person that 
person that does things, I'm the person that builds things, I'm the person that actually delivers bricks and mortar. But actually, the more I went through the slides, I thought, actually, yeah. Dream. Did I have a clue when I decided to do architecture that I'd be doing what I'm doing? I didn't have a clue. The only reason I did architecture is, and I'm not joking, our house went down. When I was 16, our house went down, and we had to get an architect to rebuild it because it was in a listed area. And that's how I got into architecture. It's really important that you know what you want. In my case, I was really clear what I didn't want. I didn't want to sit in an office for the next 20 years doing door schedules. I wanted to do something interesting. I wanted to be challenged. So if you're sitting there thinking, I'm qualified, not quite sure what I want, try and think as much about what you don't want to do. And that will help. Because if somebody then says to you, do you want to sit in an office and do this? And you think, no. <laughs> then that's telling you it's the wrong job. Believe. Resiliency is probably my most important asset. I'm resilient because I come from a big family. I'm also resilient because I've had a lot of issues with health and stuff in my life. That has made me super resilient. Like I said, I am not the smartest person I know. I am not shot. But I'm probably the most resilient person. Um, I'm afraid I've worked with lots and lots of really clever women who don't have the ability just to push through and just keep going. And it's something that is really underestimated. If you're sitting there and you're the person who can get things done, getting things done is a huge asset in the workplace, male or female. And then achieve. So, yeah, okay, work hard. Actually, work smart, right? Working hard, anybody can work hard, right? But if you're working hard at the wrong things, you're not being smart. So work smart, right? Don't just put in the hours, actually deliver stuff. And the other thing is have fun. I love what I do. I really do. I've never ever not enjoyed what I do. So if you're not enjoying what you do, it's your career move. And can I give you three little bits of advice? So my mentor when I was oh, early 20s in Finland um, gave me three bits of advice, which at the time you kind of go, that were great. <coughs> Always hire people that are smarter than yourself. Now that sounds stupid. If you're sitting there as a hiring manager, you're thinking, I don't want people to challenge me. But God, he was right. Now I've turned that into, and this is, sounds politically correct, take it what it is, but the more diverse your team is, the more inclusive you can be for different religions, genders, etc. The team will always perform better. If I'm sitting in a room of 40 people that look like me, have my background, have my experiences, I am not going to get the best advice. So the more diverse you can make that team, the more people with different backgrounds you can get in that room, the better you will perform. And you need to be challenged. I had an early meeting this morning with my head of commercial management and we're having a slightly vocal disagreement about the contract form, let me put it that way. Finished the meeting, everybody else left the room, and I said, keep challenging me. I might not agree with you, but I am listening. And you might win me over, so don't stop. Keep challenging. Because I might not always be the smartest person in the room, I usually am. Uh, so I might not <laughs> agree with you. Second one, always move job or role when you stop learning. So right now on this project, I am learning a huge amount about a whole bunch of things. Working with the city, working with the council, working with all these stakeholder groups. If when I stop learning, I will go to something different. If you look at my <coughs> career, every three years roughly I've moved. Not necessarily company, but within the company. Again, if you're sitting there and you are bored with what you're doing, God, move, 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 move. You'll get bored. Never get bored. Now, third thing he said, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm dating myself here, right? So at the time, wheels on luggage was an innovation. 
And I'm not joking, it was an innovation. I turned up to Finland and I had two bags like this. And he turned up with a really trolley and I was like, oh right, he said, always buy luggage with books. And he was right. They're probably not the most profound thing he ever said to me. <laughs> so, my last bit of advice then, because the luggage on wheels is pretty given these days, <laughs> is by believing yourself. Same thing as Sarah said. If you are not confident, if you're not sure this is what you want to do, nobody else is going to do it for you. Right? You're going to get help along the way. People are never going really to block you. But if you don't believe in yourself, if you're not you know, confident in yourself, if you're not sure what you want to do, nobody else is going to do it for you. You own your own career. You own your own life. Don't blame others. It's yours to make a success. You'll get lots and lots and lots of help. <coughs> okay, and that is me finished. Okay, thank you very much.